everyone. Thank you for joining us for our March AIDS Clinical Conference. It's our yearly CROI update, and I am very pleased to introduce our speakers today. I wanted to get started on time since um, we have a lot of content to cover and three fabulous speakers. So our three speakers are Dr. Raka Kumbakar, who is a senior fellow in infectious diseases and Dr. Jihan Budak, who is an assistant professor at, um, and also in infectious diseases and um, assistant director at the Madison Clinic. And then Adrian Shapiro, who's also an assistant professor in um, global health and infectious diseases. And thank you all so much for um, joining us today. So we'll go ahead and get started. First, we're gonna have Dr. Kumbakar talk about prevention strategies for HIV. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Sharisha, and I'm just going to share my screen. And I'm just going to confirm that that looks good. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, so like Sharisha said, I'm going to start with some updates from Corey this year on HIV prevention. I have no disclosures. So as an outline for my talk, I'm going to focus initially on some new data on long-acting cabotegravir as PrEP. Uh, with updates from HBTN 083, and then I'll go into other prevention modalities briefly with some updates on Aslatrovir and the Depipirine vaginal ring. So starting right off the bat with CabLA as PrEP, there's some updates from HBTN 083 that I think are pretty exciting. So as a reminder, HBTN 083 is a double-blind randomized controlled trial of men who have sex with men and transgender women at increased risk of HIV globally. HBTN 083 and 084 in cisgender women have demonstrated that long-acting cabotegravir is superior to daily oral TDF-FTC or tenofovir amtricitabine for HIV as pre-exposure prophylaxis, with a 66% reduced risk for HIV acquisition in the CabLA arm versus daily oral PrEP. So this has led to FDA approval in addition to the CDC guidelines, as I think many of us know now, for CabLA as PrEP. This abstract presented at CROI provides updates of the blinded study period. So in this figure, that's step one and step two of the one-to-one -one randomization to either oral PrEP or CAB-LA with an oral lead-in, and new data on the unblinded study period, which is step three, during which participants were unblinded and provided open-label TDF-FTC. So here I've presented the data for the updated blinded and unblinded year of follow-up, which is year one unblinded, or that's how it's referred to. And so I've tried to box in ways that make sense uh, some of the results. So up that top blue box shows that in the updates to the blinded trial data, there were two additional infections, bringing our numbers up to 14 for CAB and 41 for TDF-FTC with a preserved hazard ratio of 0.34. In the year one unblinded, in the second blue box, there were 11 new infections in the CAB-LA arm and 31 in the TDF-FTC arm, again with a similar hazard ratio of 0.33. Something to note, though, is that the incident rates in this unblinded period were much higher, about 1.5 times higher than in the blinded period. But in that last blue box, you can see that combined efficacy stayed the same with an unchanged hazard ratio. So this begs the question, why higher rates in the unblinded? So to address that, uh, the first part is that I have boxed in red now up at the top and bottom study product adherence. And so you can see that the, the, it declined in both arms. In the TDF-FTC arm, there was a drop from 86% to 76% in plasma tenofovir levels. And in the CAB-LA arm, there was a decrease in CAB injection coverage from 92% to about 80%. So the investigators felt that this would be expected to explain about 40% of the incident cases. And they felt that the remaining 60% was from increased con contribution of person time from high incidence regions and really Latin America in the year one unblinded period. Those individuals were enrolled later, so more person years were contributed to the unblinded time period. Next, I'll characterize the incident infections in the CAB-LA arm. And I've separated it into um, the timing of the data. So in the blinded data, which has already been published, there were four baseline or prevalent cases, five that occurred more than six months after the last CAB exposure, three that occurred during the oral lead-in period, and four which occurred despite on-time cabotegravir injection. In the updated blinded data, 
both new infections in the cap arm occurred despite on-time cabotegravir injection. And in the year one unblinded data of the 11 infections, one occurred despite on-time cab injection, three occurred during mostly on-time injection, meaning that at least one injection prior to infection occurred with a greater than eight week delay in injections, and seven occurred with a greater than six, greater than six months, excuse me, after the last cab exposure. Not included were six individuals who had infection more than three years after enrollment, and they will be investigated in the tail phase. So here are the author conclusions. The advantage for long-acting cabotegravir as PrEP persists with an additional year of follow-up. Increased HIV incidence in both arms may be attributable to lower adherence and increased contribution from high incidence regions, but there were no new safety concerns. And cab -LA PrEP breakthrough infections remain very rare, but unexplained. And so now in HPTN 083, there are a total of seven cases of breakthrough despite on-time injections in nearly 5,000 person years of participant follow-up. So this is a nice transition into the second abstract presented at Cori about HPTN 083, cab -LA as PrEP, early detection of HIV may reduce INSTI or integrase inhibitor resistance risk. So breakthrough HIV infection is difficult to detect while on long-acting cabotegravir. CAB suppresses viral replication, it delays antibody production, and thus rapid tests and antigen antibody assays often fail to detect infection. Supplemental antibody testing may be negative or indeterminate for months, and HIV RNA levels are often low or undetectable for long periods. And the risks of delayed detection of infection include delayed ART initiation, INSTI resistance, and impact on both personal health and subsequent HIV transmission. So what the investigators did here is they looked at all incident HIV infections among the more than 2,000 individuals enrolled in the cabotegravir arm. All of those with viral loads over 500 had genotyping performed. And the investigators looked at the five cases in which INSTI RAMs or integrase resistance assay mutations developed and two in which the viral load remained under 500 and genotyping was thus unable to be performed. In all seven of those participants, detection of infection using rapid tests and antigen antibody assays was delayed and all seven ended up receiving cabotegravir injection after infection had occurred. So the goal here was to assess whether earlier detection of HIV using an RNA assay for screening reduces INSTI resistance risk. Investigators looked at, excuse me, 21 samples from seven participants, and they performed retrospective qualitative RNA testing. And then for each case, they looked at the first HIV positive visit identified retrospectively by qualitative RNA and compared that temporally to the first site identified HIV positive visit by antigen antibody assay. And another really interesting thing they were able to do was run um, integrase uh, genotyping on low viral loads. So they did both the standard GenoSure and used a low HIV-1 RNA in C resistance assay done by single genome sequencing at the University of Pittsburgh. So what I'm showing here is on that graphic on the right, this is how Dr. Eshelman presented each of the seven cases to kind of show temporally what was going on. And that red vertical line there is the first HIV positive visit that was retrospectively identified by the qualitative RNA assay. The blue vertical line is the first site identified positive visit. Green vertical lines represent cabotegravir injections. Orange dots represent cabotegravir concentrations. And up at the top, you can see the results of various kinds of testing, but I think the big takeaways are that bold underlined mutations are INSTI mutations. And those highlighted in yellow are those picked up by that low viral load genotyping assay. And rather than present all seven of these to you, I thought I would just summarize the results. So in five of the seven cases, major INSTI mutations were first detected retrospectively in low viral load samples, not just in the high viral load breakthrough samples. Single genome sequencing was successful for 18 of the 21 samples detect or tested and detected INSTI RAMs in six of the seven participants, including both who had no prior genotyping results. Using the qualitative RNA assay, which has a limit of detection of 30 copies per mil, Detected infection before a major INSTI RAM was detected in four of the cases or before additional INSTI RAMs accumulated in two cases. And finally, INSTI RAMs developed after the first positive visit in six of the seven cases and more accumulated in the one case with a major mutation at the first positive visit. So here are the author conclusions. 
HIV screening with a sensitive RNA assay and those on cab la prep can identify earlier infection. This may allow for earlier ART initiation and reduced risk of NC resistance, and this should be performed using the most sensitive RNA assay available. These findings support the language in the US package insert and recent CDC guidance for HIV testing in the setting of cab la prep. And they just noted that there is no data yet available on the use of NCD-based ART in infections that occur in the setting of cabotegravirus prep. And I do want to highlight, and the authors themselves highlighted this, that in the context of proven high efficacy, CabLA should also be considered for HIV prep in settings where HIV RNA screening is not readily available. And I'm curious to hear people's thoughts, particularly here, I think thinking about uh, barriers to utilizing CabLA prep in real world settings and thinking about the ability to do HIV RNA screening. But before that, I'll switch to other prevention modalities. So first, just some updates on islatravir. Islatravir is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, or NRTTI, under development for treatment and prevention. There are two formulations under study for PrEP, a once monthly oral formulation and a once yearly subdermal implant. And though previous data had demonstrated safety and tolerability, there is a new change where uh, the Islatravir program is on FDA hold, and this is based on drops in lymphocytes and CD4 count in both the treatment and PrEP programs, and so it is now under review. Nonetheless, I thought I would provide some updates on week 24 data of the phase 2A trial of monthly oral Islatravir for PrEP. The study design here is 2 to 2 to 1 Islatravir, 60 milligrams, 120 milligrams, or placebo, uh, the first abstract presented was about metabolic and renal outcomes, the justification being this is something we are concerned about in TDF, FTC. And what they were able to show is that there were no discontinuations at week 24 for metabolic or renal reasons. There were small non-significant changes in weight and trunk fat that seemed to be dose dependent but not statistically significant. And there were no changes in renal function or bone mineral density. The second abstract presented with this data looked at islatravir distribution in mucosal tissues. So this was cervical, vaginal, and rectal in PBMC and in plasma after the monthly oral dosing. And here the big takeaways is that they were able to find comparable levels of drug concentrations across all tissue types in women and men, and that there was a high correlation between plasma islatravir levels and active phosphorylated islatravir in tissue, meaning we could use systemic islatravir PK as a surrogate for tissue exposure. So we'll see what next steps are for Islatravir, um, but we'll just be waiting in the meantime. Finally, I wanted to end with some data on the depivirine vaginal ring. And this is an abstract called Choice and Adherence to Depivirine Ring or Oral Prep by Young African Women in Reach. I'll start by noting that in the US, the FDA is no longer considering the depivirine vaginal ring for approval. This is because of a voluntary removal for approval consideration as initial feedback was the FDA was unlikely to support US approval given the context of current HIV prevention landscape for women in the US. Nonetheless, the WHO recommends the depivirine vaginal ring as a PrEP option for women. I think I just saw that South Africa has approved it to be added to their formulary. And this is really based on prior data that it reduces the risk of HIV-1 infection by about 30% in two phase three studies. And there's open label extension data demonstrating that that efficacy increases with adherence. So with increased ring use that went to over 50%. It's also well tolerated and there's no real difference in, in an RTI resistance development. The REACH trial is a randomized crossover trial in adolescent girls and young women. Previous trials had looked at older women, or older than 21 at least. And I thought this was a really interesting design. So individuals were randomized to either monthly depivirine vaginal ring or daily oral TDF FTC for six months. Then they were crossed over. And then there was a third six month period where they were able to choose their option. And so previous data from the first two periods demonstrated higher ring acceptability and compliance over oral prep. And then in the choice period, 67% chose the ring 31% chose oral PrEP, and 2% chose neither. Residual depivirine levels in the used rings showed some to high use of the ring, and then there was moderate to high adherence to oral PrEP. Something to point out is high adherence to oral PrEP in the crossover period was strongly associated with the choice of oral PrEP, and there was no such association for the brains. So the author conclusions here were that adolescent girls and young women can make informed choices about HIV prevention products, 
and are motivated to continue to use a product of their preference after a previous oral prep or reuse. So with that, I just wanna summarize what I think the big takeaways from uh, prevention studies in Croy this year were. Cab LA for HIV prep in men who have sex with men and transgender women remains superior to daily oral prep. Breakthrough infection on Cab LA prep remains rare but unexplained, but the most dreaded outcome of INSTE resistance may be mitigated by sensitive RNA assay screening. In terms of other prep formulations, Islatrovir has a less certain feature due to its clinical hold, and the Depivirine vaginal ring is not being reviewed in the US, but remains a um, promising option for adolescent girls and young women. And I just wanna conclude by saying, I think this is a very old adage in PrEP, but there is really no one size fits all PrEP option and choice is critical. And I think hearing about all these options for me was really inspiring to hear that there might be a lot of options for people in the future. And with that, I'm gonna switch over to Dr. Budak. Thank you. And I will be sharing my screen. Thank you, Raka, for that wonderful review. And I will now be talking about treatment updates. Uh, I've got no conflicts of interest or relationships to disclose. Um, and as a reminder, racism, not race, creates and perpetuates health disparities. So for today, we'll be talking um, about the following uh, topics. Uh, ART and pregnancy, where I'll be giving a brief update on the IMPACT 2010 study and dolutegravir and neural tube defects. Then we'll be spending most of the time talking about ART options for drug-resistant HIV, focusing on the Nadia trial and also the Vicen trial. And then just briefly at the end, touching on um, a couple topics of interest, the third HIV remission case, giving you an update on lenacapavir and eslatrovir, and also talking about the ANCHOR study. So with that, let's start with ART and pregnancy. So as a bit of background, ART options in pregnancy remain limited. And one big study that I think we've been getting a lot of data from is the IMPACT 2010 study, which is a global multi-center randomized trial of ART naive pregnant women with HIV who are started on ART between 14 and 26 weeks gestation. And they're randomized to either TAF FTC plus dolutegravir versus TDF FTC plus dolutegravir versus TDF FTC in a favorins. And the IMPACT 2010 results that we saw from CROI in 2020 and 2021 showed us that the arms with dolutegravir had superior virologic efficacy and closer to expected weight gain during pregnancy. And that TAF FTC plus dolutegravir had the lowest rate of adverse pregnancy outcomes through 50 weeks postpartum. And then at this CROI, we got a little bit more data about um, infants um, and sort of their growth potential. And they found, uh, and they were looking at the growth of infants with perinatal exposure to dolutegravir versus efavirenz, and then also um, versus looking at TDF versus TAF. And so here they looked at length for age and weight for age Z scores. And they found that those were lower in the efavirenz versus dolutegravir arms. So less um, length and less weight in the fabric arms. And then within the dolutegravir arms, they found that length for age and weight for age were similar between the TDF and TAF arms. They also found that infant, uh, the, they found that weight for length Z scores were no different between arms. And then also found that infants born to mothers starting a fabric in pregnancy were smaller throughout infancy, that rates of stunting were high across all arms, but higher in the efavirenz arm, and that infant growth was similar following exposure to maternal TDF or TAF with dolutegravir. Uh, this is kind of not really surprising. We have heard this, that efavirenz stunts growth in both during pregnancy and in the infant. Um, and um, so I think that this just really affirms what we had seen before, but gives us a little bit more data about the infants. The other uh, quick abstract that I wanted to share regarding ART and pregnancy was an update on neural tube defects um, and specifically looking at neural tube defects with dolutegravir in the United States. And as a reminder, the SAPAMO study was a big um, landmark study in Botswana um, that was actually looking at pregnancy outcomes. And during it, they happened to notice that there was a signal and some concern about dolutegravir and neural tube defects and specifically dolutegravir used in the period conception and first trimester time periods. Um, that was first shared in May of 2018, and we have been getting uh, data since then that eventually, as of April 2020, showed us that the incidence of neural tube defects was not statistically significant um, in those taking dolutegravir versus, versus those who were not taking dolutegravir. As a reminder, in Botswana, um, folic acid is not uh, supplemented there. Um, uh, and so this study wanted to look at rates of 
neural tube defects with dilutite reuse in the US, where as we all know, we do have folic acid supplementation. This is a retrospective review of two large databases of pregnant persons um, in the US between the years 2008 and 2009. And as you can see here, um, this is sort of the big study looking at really, um, as you can tell, very many individuals. Um, the, then in red, I wanted to highlight what the neural tube defect rates were. And here you can see that in women um, without HIV, um, these were the numbers here, um, and then compared to women with HIV, uh, and then women with HIV who are on an ART that was not dilutegravir. And then similarly down here, we've got uh, neural tube defects seen in this many women without HIV, this many women with HIV on dilutegravir, and again, this many women with HIV on other ART. So the big takeaway was that there are no neural tube defects with period conception dilutegravir in the US where again, folic acid um, supplementation is used. And so our takeaway points, and I will include some conclusions for um, two of the three sections today, uh, that new data from IMPACT 2010 continues to reassure us regarding dilutegravir and TAF, in pregnancy uh, and postpartum, that dilutegravir containing regimens have superior virologic efficacy at delivery, and that TAF containing regimens have the lowest composite frequency of adverse pregnancy outcomes. And again, that dilutegravir was not associated with neural tube defects in the US infants that were exposed periconception. And as a reminder, the 2021 DHHS perinatal guidelines, which I, were updated in uh, late fall of 2021, recommend dilutegravir and TAF as preferred ART in pregnancy and in the periconception period. So next, moving on to ART options for drug-resistant HIV. So as a bit of background, um, the Donning study uh, showed that dilutegravir was superior to boosted lipinavir as salvage therapy. And then a subsequent sub-analysis showed that dilutegravir plus two NRTIs, regardless of pre-existing resistance associated mutations to one of those NRTIs, maintained virologic suppression. Uh, this was, uh, the sub-analysis was shared at CORE in 2019. And that's actually kind of where we all, um, I think saw that and felt comfort with using dilutegravir plus two NRTIs, specifically TDF FTC or TAF FTC within the presence of an M184V uh, mutation. And then in the Donning study as well, they saw that dilutegravir in the group where they had dilutegravir, people failed on dilutegravir, that they failed and developed integrase resistance, not all the time, but that it occurred. But when people failed in the lipinavir arm, that they did not fail with resistance to the protease inhibitor. So if that's setting the stage um, for a couple of years ago, last year at CROI, we learned about the NADIA study, which stands for nucleosides and darunavir dilutegravir in Africa. This was a multi-center non-inferiority randomized trial of people with HIV failing TDF and then 3TC or FTC plus an NNRTI-based regimen who were then um, randomized to and were compared uh, using dilutegravir versus boosted darunavir and comparing TDF versus AZT. This was significant because in donning, they compared dilutegravir to boosted lipinavir, which is used quite prevalently worldwide. But in the US, we use darunavir predominantly. And also darunavir is the best in class PI as compared to lipinavir. So I appreciate that Nadia um, sort of built upon donning and said, hey, let's compare dilutegravir to the best PI that we have. And last year we saw 48 week data that showed that dilutegravir was non-inferior to darunavir in these settings and that TDF was non-inferior to um, uh, AZT. And that those with viral rebound, again, developed integrase resistance while on dilutegravir. There were four cases of that at that time, but no PI resistance developed while on darunavir. And so now we have updated data um, to 96 weeks. And so as a reminder, I kind of already shared this a little bit, but the study design of NIDIA was again, taking these patients who are on an NNRTI based regimen for at least six months who had treatment failure, which they described as, or defined as a viral load greater than a thousand, did a two by two factorial randomization where they randomized 464 patients to dilutegravir and then darunavir, and then took those cohorts of patients and further randomized them to dilutegravir plus um, TDF3TC or uh, zidovudine and 3TC. And again, the same for darunavir, followed for up to 96 weeks, looking at a primary outcome of viral load less than 400. And as a reminder, although oftentimes in the US we look at viral loads less than 200, worldwide, a lot of the viral suppression data looks at a viral load uh, less than 400. 
Uh, this occurred at seven sites um, in Uganda, Kenya, and Zimbabwe, but mostly in Uganda. 61% of patient participants were female. The median age was 34. The median CD4 count was 189. 51% of people had a CD4 count less than 200, and 28% of people had a viral load greater than 100,000. The median time on first-line ART was 3.7 years. 86% of people had a baseline M184V, and 50% of people had a baseline K65R. So this is a group um, with, relative, with a decent amount of NRTI resistance, and half of whom had high-level NRTI resistance. So the 96-week data showed that dalutegravir is non-inferior to boosted darunavir. Here in the sort of first two rows, you'll see the HIV um, RNA level less than 400, and you'll see here that um, this was not statistically significant and was non-inferior. And then in the bottom part, you'll notice that their secondary and other efficacy outcomes were looking at viral rebound. And I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom row where they looked at people with viral rebound greater than a thousand um, copies per milliliter and, and looked at how many of them had greater than or equal to one major resistance associated mutation to dalutegravir or darunavir. So in the dalutegravir arm of the 20 people who had a viral rebound with a viral load greater than a thousand, seven of them had resistance to dalutegravir. And in the darunavir group, 26 people um, had viral rebound to greater than a thousand, but none of them had resistance to darunavir. Next, they looked at um, the sort of comparison of TDF versus AZT. And this is different than what we saw at the 48-week data. Whereas 48-week data showed that TDF was non-inferior to AZT, here it shows that TDF is superior to AZT. Um, and again, you can see that here in this first, um, the second row right here. And then again, drawing your attention to the bottom two rows where you'll see that if you, of the 13 people who failed, um, in the TDF and dalutegravir arm, two of them had resistance to dalutegravir, and of the 33 people who failed um, while on AZT, 3TC, and dalutegravir, five of them had dalutegravir resistance. Again, no resistance was seen in the PI arm. They then shared further subgroup analyses, and these will mostly be up here as a resource. And you can see in the orange is dalutegravir, blue is darunavir, and they compared and contrasted all these different scenarios. And you'll see here essentially that the dalutegravir and darunavir are non-inferior. Um, this red box was placed there by the um, abstract presenter, and I could not get rid of it. Uh, and then this is looking at um, comparing tenofovir and zidovudine. Uh, and here you'll just take, a, the takeaway uh, is that an orange is tenofovir, blue is zidovudine. And whereas on the previous slide, they seemed very similar, here there are discrepancies. And notably, um, the, you see here that with a K65R um, or N present, the tenofovir was non-inferior to zidovudine. That is surprising because I think a lot of us consider um, AZT to be hypersusceptible in the presence of a K65R. Um, not that many of us use um, AZT due to many of its side effects, but this was um, significant data and I am glad that there is a red box still here from the presenter um, that I could not get rid of. Uh, and then last, this is the info on the dalutegravir resistance associated mutations, mostly as a resource. You'll see in this far left column, this is the regimen in the trial. This is the dalutegravir resistance level based on the Stanford resistance database. And then here are the dalutegravir mutations. The big takeaway here is that it, you'll notice that if you were on a dalutegravir based regimen in the AZT arm, there was more dalutegravir resistance that we saw and higher level dalutegravir resistance. So most dalutegravir rams occurred in the AZT arm. These are a list of the key dalutegravir rams that we saw, um, and that's that. Moving on to the VISEN trial, um, which is a 144-week randomized open-label non-inferiority study in Zambia of 1,200 people with HIV with and without viral suppression. So slightly, this is a different study design um, than the Nadia trial. And they mostly compared TLD or TDF3TC and dalutegravir, which is a combination pill that is available through a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, comparing it to TAF-FTC plus dalutegravir. This is the study design here on the right, where again, these were about 1,200 people um, on efavirenz or nivirapine-based regimens who either were virally suppressed, which they defined as less than 1,000, randomized to TLD or TAF, FTC, dalutegravir. And then this is the group um, who was failing with a viral load greater than 1,000, then randomized to TLD, TAF, FTC, dalutegravir, or two PI-based regimens, 
but notably combined with AZT3TC and also using lopinavir and atazanavir, not our best in class PI. Um, and again, this is significant because in this study, they sort of randomized them and didn't have genotypic data, which as we know, in many situations, we don't have that data. And the results showed that in the arm that was virally suppressed or what they defined as virally suppressed, that TAF FTC dolutegravir was non-inferior to TLD. And that had not been shown before, so that was helpful. And then in the arm that was um, failing, with a viral load greater than 1,000, TAF, FTC, dolutegravir was non-inferior to TLD, and both of those were superior to the combined PI arm. Though again, here's my caveat, that was the uh, lopinavir and atazanavir combined with an AZT-containing um, regimen. The other thing that was interesting from the VISEN study was the impact on weight gain. Um, here you will see in the cohort of individuals uh, on the upper graph with a viral load less than 1,000 or suppressed, that the in orange, the TAF FTC dolutegravir arm um, gained more weight than the TLD arm. Whereas in those who were not suppressed started on these uh, different regimens, there was sort of a similar amount of weight gain. Um, then looking at the group that was not suppressed, so viral load greater than 1,000 in women, you'll notice that the TAF containing regimen led to more weight gain than the other regimens. Whereas in men, um, in the bottom, the TLD containing regimen led to more weight gain. So takeaway points from these two studies, are the Nadia trial affirms the practice of using dolutegravir with less than two active NRTIs in the setting of NRTI resistance, um, typically with an M184V, that it kind of changes how active we might consider tenofovir when paired with dolutegravir to be in the presence of a K65R. We don't really have the information about tenofovir when paired with other regimens, but this was quite interesting. And it reaffirms that dolutegravir can fail with integrase resistance, but the PIs generally do not fail with PI resistance. And then in the VISEN trial, um, that affirmed that we can use either dolutegravir or a second line PI as second line therapy. Um, with the group that had viral suppression, TAF FTC was associated with more weight gain than TLD. And then if you were not virally suppressed, TAF FTC uh, dolutegravir was associated with more weight gain than TLD in women, whereas TLD was associated with more weight gain than TAF FTC dolutegravir in men. And then a rapid fire other brief topics of interest uh, before handing it over to Adrian. So I wanted to touch quickly on the third HIV remission case um, as background um, and reminders. It was both the Berlin patient um, and London patient underwent um, stem cell transplantation from donors who were homozygous for the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. As a reminder, CCR5 is a required co-receptor for most strains of HIV and is um, and this uh, CCR5 Delta 32 homozygous mutation is, is extremely rare. Um, then uh, the London, so that's that sort of background. The Berlin patient um, was presented in 2009, London patient in 2019. So there was a big about decade gap between those two remission cases. And although the London patient signified that this approach could be replicated after the Berlin patient, so that's why that was significant, people realized, wow, this takes a lot of work that using this approach to achieve remission is both high risk and high cost. At IAS in 2020, they shared about a Sao Paulo patient who was thought to achieve remission using a non-stem cell transplant um, approach, but unfortunately that person had virologic rebound at 72 weeks. And the other thing is that the, both the Berlin and London patient used stem cell transplantation, but umbilical cord blood cells had not previously been used to achieve HIV remission. Um, umbilical cord blood cells can be banked, um, which is significant and can be easily screened, or not easily, but can be screened rather for the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. So it kind of opens up this new world um, of potential remission. And this case was one of using a haplocord uh, stem cell transplantation. They described the woman as being middle-aged, a US woman of mixed race who had HIV and then subsequently developed high-risk AML. Uh, on the right, you'll see that her um, HIV-1 AML treatment course, which is there as a resource, but I will not be focusing on this image. And she underwent a haplocord stem cell transplantation um, of cord blood donor homozygous for the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation, did not have enough, so they needed also some CD34 selected haploidentical stem cells. This person had 100% chimerism with the donor homozygous for the CCR5 uh, Delta 32 mutation, uh, similar to both the Berlin and London patients, and signifies the first time using cord blood cells or haplocord to achieve HIV remission. Changing uh, 
now to Islatravir and lenacapavir. I know that Dr. Kumbakar already touched a bit on Islatravir, the NRTTI. Uh, I will not actually focus on this much, especially because most studies at CORI 2022 regarding Islatravir were for PrEP, but as Dr. Kumbakar touched upon, um, this remains on FDA hold due to a 30 to 50% mean drop in CD4 cell count in the treatment studies. Uh, I think we will learn more um, in the coming months about whether this um, is due to the Islatravir itself, whether this was due to a dose um, issue. And I think um, as Dr. Kumakar mentioned, the future is of Islatravir is currently on hold uh, and hopefully we'll hear more soon. Then I also wanted to mention um, updates from Lenacapa another novel agent, which is an HIV-1 capsid inhibitor. That is also currently on a partial FDA hold, but that's because of issues with the glass vials and hopefully it can be rectified soon. The two updates we got from uh, CROI this year were from the Calibrate study and the Capella study. In the Calibrate study, we saw that after using lenacapavir plus two drugs for induction, switching to Q6 month lenacapavir plus either TAF alone or bictegravir alone, so len sub Q, Q6 months plus one of these two ARTs led to viral suppression at week 54 in 85 to 90% of ART naive people with HIV. And then in the Capella study, we saw that with an optimized background regimen, Q6 month lenacapavir added led to viral suppression at week 52 in 83% of individuals with multi-drug resistant HIV. We'd heard about the Calibrate and Capella studies before, but now we have um, about 50, you know, 52 and 54 week data on that. And last, I'm gonna close with the um, update on the anchor study. Um, hopefully this paper will be getting published soon so we can all read about it more. And um, there was a very nice 30 minute sort of symposium by Dr. Joel Polevsky about the anchor study that I do recommend for people if you have time. And um, some of it was that it really gave us a nice background about why this is important. So the reasons why this is important is that people with HIV um, tend to have larger and multifocal um, lesions of anal H cell that high resolution endoscopy HRA requires significant practice, that clinicians may inadequately treat lesions and that new lesions may arise. So these are all issues, um, especially since we see higher rates of anal cancer in people with HIV. And so the anchor study looked to um, do the four following things. Number one, um, sort of identify whether treating anal H cell reduces the incidence of anal cancer in people with HIV, determine the safety of treatments for anal H cell, develop an instrument to measure the impact of anchor on the quality of life, and then later collect specimens and data to create a bank um, of predictors and biomarkers for um, progression of H cell to cancer. On the right, you'll see here is that there is, this is their sort of study treatment arm. And then these were people with HIV, both men and women, greater than 35 years old, screened for anal H cell. Um, if H cell was found, they were enrolled and randomized either to an active monitoring arm or a treatment arm. And the study ran from September 2014 to August 2021, um, in, where approximately 4,500 people with HIV greater than 35 were randomized to high resolution endoscopy versus active monitoring. This um, patient population had a median age of 51, 80% um, of them were male, and a third of this patient population smoked. Greater than 80% of them had an undetectable viral load, and a median CD4 was 600, so um, a relatively well sort of a group with um, high sort of immune response and good virologic suppression. 32 cancers were diagnosed, nine in the treatment arm, 21 in the active monitoring arm, with a 57% reduction in anal cancer in the treatment arm. And so the DSMB started, stopped the study early. Um, the, with the final finding that treatment of anal H cell is effective in reducing the incidence of anal cancer. Their recommendation is to optimize screening algorithms for H cell and to scale up HRA training programs. But there's all these questions and I've left this one here for you is how do we implement this? So um, that was just a teaser. I am going to stop my screen share um, and hand it over to Adrian now. Oh. Thanks so much, Dr. Budak and Dr. Kimbakar. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, great. So I'm going to wrap up the hour, not all of the hour, we'll, we'll leave some time for questions, uh, but get into some of the CROI highlights on co-infections and comorbidities. Uh, I, these are my disclosures, grant funding from VIR, and uh, echoing Jihan's um, important uh, caveat that racism not race creates and perpetuates health disparities. <clears throat> 
So for my presentation today, I'm going to highlight abstracts and symposium presentations on TB, COVID-19, and hepatitis C with a focus on uh, these infections interacting with HIV. Uh, this, this CROI conference had a lot on COVID alone, um, so I will certainly encourage folks to, to check out some of the um, COVID abstracts uh, and presentations um, after um, one, you know, once all of the talks become public, but I'm going to focus for, for this talk on the COVID and HIV interactions. And I'm going to present one abstract in detail per topic, and then a lightning round with kind of brief summaries of a few other uh, topics for each. So starting off with TB, which, so this is the, the sort of the O and the I, putting the OI in CROI. Um, starting off with TB, which remains the leading cause of mortality for people living with HIV. Um, I'm going to first talk about the ACTG A5372 interim results presented by Dr. Podney. Um, and this was a study looking at the pharmacokinetics of dalutegravir in people with HIV who were receiving the treatment or the prevention regimen 1HP for latent TB. So this is the one month of daily isoniazid and rifapentine regimen. Um, within the last few years, it was shown that 1HP, the one month daily regimen, was non-inferior to the standard of care nine months of isoniazid for TB prevention. That was the brief TB study. Um, and all of the people with HIV in that study were on efavirenz-based ART. And this is because the rifapentine component of 1HP, um, the, the metabolism induced by rifapentine can decrease dilutegravir levels. And so in studies um, that have had daily rifapentine initially um, for prevention of TB in people living with HIV, no INSTEs were, were allowed. And dilutegravir is the only INSTE that can be given with TB treatment or prevention regimens containing um, rifapentin or or FAMPIN uh, because of these drug-drug interactions. We do have recent evidence from the DOLPHIN study that a weekly TB preventive therapy regimen, so 3-HP, which is weekly three months of isoniazid and rifapentine, can be given safely with dilutegravir at the standard 50 milligram daily dose um, with no decrease in viral suppression on among people leaving with HIV, taking dalitegravir, um, receiving the 3-HP regimen. Um, and PK, study, PK data from that study showed that the geometric mean of the dalitegravir trough during the 3-HP uh, was 546 nanograms per mil. There's no data currently on the effect on dalitegravir levels or on virologic suppression of 1-HP, uh, this ultra short treatment um, prevention regimen given with dilutegravir. This obviously has really important implications for treatment shortening TB prevention regimens um, for people with HIV worldwide where increasingly dilutegravir is the mainstay of antiretroviral therapy. So this study design looked at adults with HIV who were all virally suppressed at the time of entry into the study and brought them in um, adults taking a dilutegravir based regimen with daily dilutegravir brought them in for intensive PK sampling as they took a one month course of um, 1HP, so the daily rifapentine and isoniazid. During the time they were receiving the TB prevention regimen 1HP, the dilutegravir dose was increased to twice daily. So that's the current recommendation for TB treatment given with dilutegravir um, with daily rifampin is to increase the dilutegravir dose to twice daily uh, to achieve therapeutic levels of dilutegravir throughout the treatment. So this looked at, again, 1-HP um, with dilutegravir twice daily and whatever um, non-nucleoside therapy or nucleoside therapy regimen base uh, the participant was already taking. So intensive PK sampling of dilutegravir levels and viral load testing throughout. Um, the study had recruited uh, 37 participants. We have data at this point of 27 enrolled. And the goal of this study was to see what the PK data looked like with a double dose, a BID dose of dilutegravir. And if it seemed acceptable, considering moving on to 1HP with a daily dilutegravir dose, um, which obviously has significant implications for standard dosing, fixed dose combinations, uh, which are given throughout most of the world. 
So the study investigators used a, a sort of minimum trough uh, level of dilute tigravir of 158 nanograms per mil as the, the base rate. Um, this is derived from prior study data of, um, where they considered this to be a, an absolute minimum threshold um, below which uh, dilute tigravir concentrations would not be considered therapeutic. And this, uh, this first graph showed the um, dilutegravir concentration uh, at baseline, so before taking the TB preventive therapy, um, and this was with daily dilutegravir. And then each of these boxes shows the, the weekly median dilutegravir trough uh, with dilutegravir dosing increased to BID, but being given with the daily rifapentine isoniazid. So we see a brief increase in the trough, and then a decreased steady state to something relatively close to uh, what, the, what the baseline uh, troughs were during the course. Uh, during the sampling time, 24 of the 25 participants had HIV um, viral loads that were less than 50 copies per mil at day 28 at the end of sampling. The one participant who had a detectable viral load at 160 copies per mil was resuppressed um, by day 42. Uh, and that was after switching back to daily dilutator. So the authors concluded that one dilutator trough concentrations with BID dilutator and 1HP were in fact higher than standard daily dilutator in the absence of 1HP. Um, that the decrease in dilutator trough seen through um, day three through day 28, probably indicative of a dose dependent induction of dilutator metabolism. Importantly, throughout the entire course of the 1HP, all dilutegravir troughs stayed above the dilutegravir target. So there were no hypersensitivities or serious adverse events. Uh, and the sum of the pharmacokinetic viral suppression and safety data indicate that BID dosing of dilutegravir is safe and effective with 1HP, um, opening possibilities for treatment shortening uh, TB prevention. And gave the investigators confidence that they can move on to the next stage of the study, investigating the 1HP regimen with a daily dilutegravir uh, instead of a, a BID. So we will stay tuned for, for that. Um, excuse me, a couple other TB topics that I wanted to highlight. Um, there was a really interesting implementation science study also on the topic of trying to improve TB preventive therapy for people living with HIV. This is a study that came out of Uganda and found that providing additional education and support for clinic managers did result in a modest increase in the uptake of TB preventive therapy for people living with HIV in Uganda um, that was detectable after taking into account a nationwide uh, effort to try to increase uh, uptake of um, isoniazid preventive therapy uh, that initially kind of blurred, blurred the effect. But if you, if you take out the, the effect of the IPT push, um, the, the intervention did result in more people taking or receiving indicated IPT. And that persisted throughout the COVID period, uh, which is significant because the COVID period uh, resulted in substantial disruptions to H both HIV and TB care worldwide. I'll talk a little bit about that um, in one of the later abstracts as well. Another really interesting study looked at rosuvastatin as a possible adjunctive therapy for TB. Um, and this, this is based on in vitro data showing that statins may have um, beneficial effect as a host-directed therapy to increase time to culture clearance. So this was investigated in a, an RCT of 137 people um, with rifampin-susceptible TB. Um, people were randomized to either TB standard of care or rosuvastatin 10 milligrams daily during the induction phase of TB treatment, the four drug um, period of TB treatment. Uh, unfortunately, the study found no difference in time to culture conversion. Um, and in this study, very few uh, people with HIV were included. Um, and no, so there was no subgroup um, analysis or benefits seen in specifically in people with HIV. Um, Dr. Nuremberger presented a fantastic symposium, really encouraged people to listen to both Dr. Eric Nuremberger and Dr. Susan Dorman's symposia on new TB drugs and treatment shortening regimens. Um, Eric pointed out that uh, although 
the Restuvastatin study was not, uh, did, did not show effect. There is great potential for other host-directed therapies to shorten TB treatment and improve outcomes for TB and TB HIV, um, and highlighted a number of new TB drug, both compounds and uh, long-acting formulations that are in the pipeline. Uh, Dr. Dorman highlighted recent advances in treatment shortening regimens for TB, including for people with and without HIV, um, moving to from a six month drug sensitive regimen to a four month regimen for adults that was recently shown to be effective, not inferior to um, standard six month TB treatment and a new study that was uh, then just published in the New England Journal last week showing um, that, that a, a four month regimen for children with uh, non-severe TB may also be uh, the way forward. So very encouraging for shortening TB treatment regimens, um, as well as shortening TB prevention regimens with the three month regimen and now hopefully increasing availability of the, of the 1HP regimen. All right, moving to COVID. Um, there, there was a lot of great COVID data presented at, at CROI this year. I wanna highlight briefly another study to come out of the um, Tsipamo study in Botswana, looking at birth outcomes uh, throughout the country. Um, and the motivation for this study was the, the observation that um, higher rates of adverse both parental and birth outcomes are seen in people with COVID-19 globally. And we, we have seen particularly in um, low and middle income country settings that people with HIV have worse outcomes from COVID-19. Um, there's not much evidence to date on the interaction between these two. And so the Tsipamo study was able to look at um, adverse events um, and adverse birth outcomes in women with and without HIV and with and without COVID uh, during the period of September, 2020 through November, 2021. So it was women with known HIV status who were enrolled and women who had had a COVID screening test within two weeks of the uh, delivery. Um, this is the, the uh, screening pathway. Um, they had 144 women who were both HIV, who had both HIV and COVID at the time of delivery. Um, 392 women with COVID without HIV uh, at the time of delivery um, and several thousand more HIV, uh, women with HIV um, whose data on birth outcomes with Dolly Tigerver you've seen presented earlier today. So the main finding of this study, um, two, two main findings. Uh, one, very distressing, um, consistent with global data that maternal deaths were extremely high with COVID. So the age-adjusted risk ratio was over with nearly 32 times uh, maternal death of women with COVID compared to women without COVID in this study. Uh, but there was no difference seen in terms of maternal death in women with or without HIV. Uh, for these women, uh, maternal COVID-19 vaccination status was not available, although during the study time period, less than 15% of people in Botswana were fully vaccinated. So the assumption is the majority of these women were not uh, vaccinated against COVID. Um, for uh, the general picture of uh, ART and viral suppression in Botswana uh, nationally and within this cohort, 97% of women were on ARVs uh, and the vast majority had started prior to conception. Um, this forest plot shows the relative risk of adverse birth outcomes uh, in women with and without, um, well, in the, in the neonates of uh, born to women with and without HIV and COVID. And for reference, the, uh, the reference line here at one is HIV negative, COVID negative. Um, and then the, um, we see relative risks fairly close to, um, to one for women with HIV without COVID for all outcomes, except for small for gestational age, we see a slight increase in uh, risk in women with HIV. Um, the, the orange are women without HIV with COVID. And again, a, a significant increase um, in any adverse birth outcomes and any severe adverse birth outcomes specifically with COVID. Uh, so this is COVID again, COVID without HIV. Um, the yellow dots uh, and ranges are COVID and HIV together. And in almost all cases um, uh, for poor outcomes, these the, the odds of poor outcomes are 
uh, multiplicative with both HIV and COVID. Uh, so really somewhat sobering um, outcomes seen uh, with a 5.5% absolute risk of stillbirth in infants born to mothers with COVID um, that's here. Uh, and that is not significantly more. I mean, the, the point estimate is, is significantly more than um, with, uh, HIV, uh, with HIV than with, um, without HIV. Um, but it seems because the, um, uh, the point estimate is quite similar with and without um, COVID. Sorry, <laughs> getting a little tripped up here. Um, it is, it's not clear whether COVID or HIV is completely driving this because the numbers are, are so small, but um, COVID does seem to be driving the, the adverse birth events uh, otherwise. Um, and then just to wrap up some COVID and um, HIV data from other settings, uh, really great study from Sweden looking at the National Registry of All People Hospitalized with COVID between February 2020 and August of 2021. Uh, the study is able to capture, again, all people in the country hospitalized with COVID, which included 121 people with HIV, majority of whom were virally suppressed uh, and had a very high CD4 count. Um, this study found that in Sweden, there was no increased odds of severe COVID-19 outcomes in people with HIV versus people without HIV. The odds ratio was 0.88, so slightly lower point estimate of severe COVID, oops. Um, and that, but the confidence interval included one for this odds. Um, Argentin an Argentinian cohort also found um, in looking at people with, with HIV uh, that about 20% had severe COVID requiring hospitalization. Um, but not a significant association with ART and viral load. Uh, however, an indication that in a lower CD4 was associated with higher risk of um, severe outcomes of COVID. And taken together, these, these studies are both consistent with accumulating evidence that people with HIV can have outcomes equivalent to people without HIV unless they have immune suppression. Um, and uh, so just a... a um, additional motivation to in ensure that people with HIV are engaged in care on ART, uh, virally suppressed um, with reconstituted CD4 counts during pandemic periods. Um, and although there have been tremendous global disruptions in access to HIV care and ART, uh, there is a, a great poster from San Francisco um, showing that the, the Ward 86 cohort um, found that with during the during during the covid period although there were initial disruptions to access to um, hiv care and an initial drop in community or cohort level viral suppression compared to pre covid viral suppression so this chart shows um, that about 80 80 to 83% of the cohort was virally suppressed in the pre covid time and then that dropped to closer to um, 80% after the beginning of the COVID pandemic, that community viral suppression actually increased in the post COVID era, probably due to um, outreach, in increased outreach services, housing services, um, and a return to in person visits after an initial restriction of in person access. Uh, so, excellent, excellent HIV care is still possible in the time of COVID. I realize that we are running really close to time, so I'm going to skip the, H, the Hep C section and hope that we can um, uh, I, at least have these um, posted on the website and let people ask some questions about the previous two sessions. Thank you. Thank you all so much for that wonderful overview of CROI and um, getting in so much information in such a short period of time. Um, I know that some people put some questions in the Q&A box that I think Raka most uh, already replied to. So thank you. And some put some questions in the chat. Um, are there any other questions in the last few minutes remaining for our outstanding speakers? I know um, actually there was one from Sylvia LaCourse, Dr. LaCourse, regarding implementation of uh, potentially new recommendations based on the anchor um, findings 
um, at Madison Clinic and maybe otherwise locally. So we are um, the actually the OI guidelines group is meeting later this week with Joel Polefsky and the lead of the HPV section to talk about the findings and um, what uh, recommendations would come out of that formally. So we're hoping to have some more formal guidance. Uh, based on these results, um, Dr. Shouten and Dr. Karita Stankiewicz are our high-res anoscopists here um, that have been involved in the anchor study all along as we are a site here at Madison. And we'll be um, actually for our uh, ECHO community, we'll be giving an update about the anchor results and the implications of those results. So stay tuned, we're hoping to have some firm guidance based on these results in the coming weeks to just a few months. Just wondering if there are any other questions. I know we're at time. Lots of glowing compliments, of course, for our speakers in the, in the chat box. Oh, there's, oh, thank you so much. I guess if you have any other questions, um, our speakers are usually pretty available um, to reach out to directly. So thank you all for your time and thank you so much, Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Kumbakar and Dr. Budak. Thanks everyone, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks so much.